the Society for Culture and Environment extends a warm welcome. You are watching a session on Indian Mammals, Vivek Menon in conversation with Ajoy Bhattacharya from the Bhopal Literature and Art Festival, January 2019. Mr. Vivek Menon is a wildlife conservationist, environmental commentator, author and photographer with a passion for elephants. He has been part of the founding of five environmental and conservation organizations in India. Dr. Ajoy Bhattacharya is a retired IFS officer of 1983 batch from Madhya Pradesh Kader. He has got distinctive recognition for mobilizing activities in areas of development, forestry and academics. Let me confess at the outset that probably I am the most illiterate person on this subject, the Indian mammals. The only qualification I have to be the moderator that I am a man. <laughs> That's the only qualification I have. Well, actually, may I have your attention, please? Uh, so, what I did is, uh, Immediately I got the confirmation of my participation here, I purchased this book and I also downloaded his other books into my Kindle and uh, probably some of the information I have which he does not have. Uh, besides this, there is a secret, uh, uh, there is another book which uh, related to Indian mammals that uh, secrets of Secret Lives of Indian Mammals. That's children. Okay. Right. Right. The Secret Lives of Indian Mammals. two books. Uh, his, this book, My Indian Mammals, got, a uh, Google got uh, 158 reviews and uh, 5 stars 80%. 4 stars 18%. Did you know that? You did not. And the other book, the, the reviews were less but the uh, percentage of 5 stars was very high, 85%. And uh, there is another book of, on Indian mammals by Vikram Grewal, which uh, can, uh, covers 280 species. His book covers four, more than 400 uh, species, mammal species. Out of 410, total uh, 410 species, he covers, he has covered almost all the uh, species. Ha. He actually, uh, we had some pre uh, session, conversation. So he tried to know what questions I'll ask, you know. So I did not leak out any questions. I had paper, I, I did not leak out. You know why? Had he known the questions beforehand, he would have answered from his brain, from his most enormous knowledge, from his wisdom. And uh, having not known the questions, except for questions, he will answer by his heart, by his passion, by his emotion, which he has for the wildlife. Sorry, I can not imagine. But I have very one very difficult question for him, which I'll ask at the end. And uh, if I forget, please remind me for that question. Okay. That is the book we use. So, uh, uh, to begin with, so I want to request Vivek, he has included in his uh, introduction about the background of mammals, importance, what led uh, to the writing of the book. But still, would like to hear from him what inspired him to write about mammals exclusively, uh, mammals exclusively, and also what has been the timeline. Because uh, 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 let me tell you, the value editions of this book. I'll just take one. You'll, you will have 90% and you have just 10%. Otherwise also I don't have any knowledge about the subject. So, uh, the timeline, to, to, uh, from my side I would like to, to address these two things. Your why on mammals and what has been the timeline? Because this so enormous information you have. Some value additions I could identify in your book is, one is interpretation notes on the pictures. That was excellent. If you see the pictures, I mean, what I, I uh, understand and I find it missing, the information to interpretation. You know, normally we, uh, we fail to distinguish between information and interpretation. 
So he has led the information, uh, converted the information into the interpretation through those pictures. That's one uh, validation. Another uh, uh, validation, a uh, uniqueness is the field notes. Field notes scribble. And I have a difficult question for that at the end. And uh, th third thing is the uh, context of emails of the wildlife, uh, all the persons who have contributed. For that, my question is, will they respond? Because you have mentioned the emails. I have shot a short few mails to those people you have included in that. And that has been acknowledged in a review also, which says, useful selection of this book is the crisp guidelines for enthusiastic nature lovers regarding and identifying different uh, aspects of wild animals as well as basic rules of jungle. And uh, the providing different useful content. So this review also mentions and that and another also review I wanted to read this out. I would I would read this book more like a novel, cover to cover, then a field book, a field guide book, as it has immense information, hidden stories or mysteries to unfold to any curious and childlike mind. That, that is a very, very good, very good comment. And uh, of course, and the last is which are already depicted, the pictorial acknowledgements. You have, I have given pictures of all those who have contributed to this book directly and indirectly. So, now the floor is to, we can, uh, wait. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I think the best thing is I'll show you a few slides. You know, when you come to a thing about mammals, you actually see a few slides. The, the thing I start with is, do you even know what we have in this country? Uh, the reason I'm here is because Raghav said that there's a Hachlan <laughs> festival, right? And if you're talking of Madhya Pradesh, you can't not think of the Madhya Pradesh. Uh, you heard Bittu say in the morning as well that nature forms the whole uh, of inspiration for literature. Uh, and so it's not because it's a new book, it isn't. In fact, they, my, what, my, uh, it's a 2014 book which is one of many editions. But uh, the, the book for children which I brought out uh, is, is relatively new to the year old. Uh, so this is not really a launch of the book. But still I want to find out because when I just put this up even, people are asking what this is, right? So let me just flip you through a few animal things. Give me about 15 minutes. So, uh, Make sure I have the thing. No, that's fine. I'm sure we can see. Sorry? Scroll to the side. Scroll to the side. Slide down. Switch is on the side. Switch is on the side. Jesus. I have it. Oh, yeah. Do I have points of error? Anyway, alright. So, India has about 5% of the world's mammals. Okay. Uh, and I'm not getting the statistical. This does not work. Okay. So, what's our largest mammal? I, I do this to politicians, I do this to little children. Doesn't matter. Little children get it right most often. Yeah? Is it a whale? Whale, yeah. Still, a lot of people say they have the whale. But I just wanted to tell you that the whale, oops, boy, this is really, it jumps. And that's not a good thing. Uh, Anyway, I don't think it's working very well, but the way, if people say the elephant, which many people do, the elephant more or less weighs the same amount as a ton of a blue whale. Alright? So that's the size difference. And I had actually a picture to show you that, but it doesn't seem to be coming. Yeah? Similarly, when I ask about the largest carnivore, a number of people say tiger. Yeah? Or as you said, snow leopard or something like that, right? But nobody talks about a brown bear. We are one of the few countries, only China and India have five bears. Okay? And the brown bear which we find in Kashmir and parts of Sikkim and at the top of Uttarakhand, which people don't think of as our bear. Our bear is a stock bear. Is a, well, there's once used to dance, we've got rid of that habit. Thank God for that. But nevertheless, this is the largest carnivore. It's all taken in India by different photographers, as he said. And I have a habit of using photographs of people who work on that animal. Yeah? So it's not just photographers, but people have spent a whole lifetime working on a particular animal. I try to honor them and make sure they Bats, nobody talks of bats, apart from being the smallest mammal. Yeah? 
Uh, an important thing is that one in four mammals in this country are bats. One in four. So when he said 423 actually, mammals of India, about 100 are bats, about 100 are rodents. So when you talk about going into the forest and seeing tigers and leopards, you're talking about only 50, 60 animals. The rest are bats, shrews, rodents, which nobody looks at. Yeah? Uh, when uh, this was, the book was launched in Bombay, I was telling them that the most endangered animal they possess is a bat. It's a rotten free tail bat. It's found only one cave. So I told, I told the minister, forget protecting tigers, look after the rotten free tail bat. It's got one cave. Yeah, that. And he said, what the hell is that? He said, do, do we have that in Maharashtra? Yes, you do. Right? And you have this in, in MP also. And this is annoying because this goes on. You have the buffalo, which I'll come to later in India, not only because of what I wrote, but also because the progenitor of all buffalo species in the world, right? We also, by the way, although it's not a mammal, we are the progenitor of all chicken in the world, right? Which is a red jungle farm. So our forests are provided for all the hens, the eggs, and the milk uh, that has come out. I often joke in an Indian context that for the Punjabi and the Haryanvi, we would have finished without the forest without the chicken and, and the buffalo, right? We have, this is the thing that our forests have given, and I'll come back to this. Now, people don't know, people talk about a tiger, because in Madhya Pradesh you must talk about it, but I won't talk very much about it. But you don't know much about the lion. You know it exists, you know, because Modi is from Gujarat and the lion is from Gujarat. But do you know what's the difference between this lion and the African lion? Anybody? Mane. Yeah? Mane. Huh? Mane is not there. the Mane, it's a bald lion. Why is it bald? Like many of our males, yeah. but although I, I, I want to attribute the same thing to, to, to the males. This is a lack of a genetic variation, right? It's at the absolute end of its range. It's an African animal which has come across from Persia into India, and this is the absolute end of the range, about 10,000 years of genetic degradation, and it is left with a belly ridge and no hair on the head, showing actually a very low genetic variation in this animal. But we still have it at least, unlike most of the uh, parts of the world. And the leopard, the most adaptive of cats, I don't know if any of you have seen in Google, on Google, uh, a, a wonderful nighttime shot of Bombay. There's a film that's uh, circulating, if, if, you, if you Google it up, of the number of leopards that are walking in the night, right on the main roads. And people are not looking at it. Yeah? You don't know it unless you look through a, a camera that's meant to capture that. And in Borivili, next to Borivili, you can see these leopards mm -hmm. on the main roads of, of Bombay. Yeah? They're there. So when people say leopard has strayed, I keep asking them, strayed from where? They have three generations, they have are breeding inside the city, in sugarcane fields. They've never seen a forest in their life. So this whole thing of catching tigers, I heard somebody asking me too, this famous tigers that has created a lot of so Catching them and putting them elsewhere. Where are you putting them to? There is this old forester mentality that they put them into deep forests. No, they've adapted. They've adapted to you. You are not adapted to them. You are afraid of them. But they are not. Yeah. By the way, black panther, you could say, is a leopard. Okay. So that is a snow leopard, which we were, we were talking about. Oops, it's not going all over the place. Um, sorry. Oh, maybe it needs space. Okay, oops. So that's the snow leopard, which we have in this country. But what people don't know, it's on the cover of my book. I refuse to put a tiger. My publisher said tiger, only tigers said. So I said, why do tigers say? They said cats, everybody likes cats. Of course, forward facing eyes. For 35 years, I've raised money for my I know that I can talk to people about elephants, they're interested. But unless I talk to them about tigers or cats, they don't give money. People reach into their wallets and I collect a lot of money for my life. For 35 years, it's only with cats. Okay, why? Forward facing eyes. They captivate you. Green color. So you need something like that. But I said, why not another cat, which we have, a mysterious cat that people can't recognize, which is the clouded leopard, yeah? The clouded leopard is even more mysterious than, uh, can I operate out of that? I think that may be easier and faster, otherwise I'd spend most of the time doing this. Yeah, that's better. So, our smallest big cat, when you say big cat, what do you mean? It's a cat that can roar. Any cat that can produce a roar from
from this, uh, the larynx is called a big cat. Any cat that mews or purrs is called a small cat. It's as simple as that. Okay. So this one can't grow. However, it's large. And I can attest that having had two of them jump on my head several times when I was trying to put them back. We have rehabilitated cloud leopards into the forest in Manas. And when we're rehabilitating them, they have a habit of hiding up in the forest and jumping at you. And this is particularly worrisome because this cat, adapted on the trees, uh, adapted for, for eating monkeys, but has the longest canine of any cat ever alive, longer than the saber tooth tiger, because it is supposed to pierce the, the skull of a monkey as it jumps on you. Okay? It's an extraordinary cat. We still have it. People don't talk about it. They talk about tigers. So I, I'm just talking about the fact that we have a huge number of things that people don't know about. The only one which got away, the cheetah, the only thing that we really, from larger peninsular India that has gone extinct. Of course, the two rhinos, the Javan and the Sumatran, did exist in the fringes of Northeast. We lost the Sumatran in 1936 and the Javan in 1906, but both of these did exist. But cheetah was the only one which went away. Okay? The rhino in Kajaranga, what people don't know, so you talk about the field notes. I try to you know, put my own experiences into this to tell you differences which will really interest people. What is the big difference between our rhino and the rhinos in Africa? Of course, there are many anatomical differences and all that is there in the book. But also, an interesting fact, our rhino bites. It doesn't use its horn. I can tell you, because it's, it's bitten me. Right? It comes up to you, puts its hooves and bites you. Yeah? It, its horn is very loosely put. Have you ever removed a rhino horn? We are rhino horn poacher. I have removed several. Just cut through with a pen knife and you can knock it with your hand. If you're as big as me, you can knock it off with your hand. Right? It's loosely put. It's a bunch of hair. Not, not a bunch of hair, say, which people believe. But it's not. It's just hair. Yeah? Loosely matted. Uh, just one or two more and then I'll, I'll leave it to Andrea to ask me questions. Whatever his googlies are. Uh, did you know, and many people still don't know, that our closest relative are these two gibbons. We have two gibbons, sir, in India. The western and the eastern ruler gibbon. And most people don't know that we have this ape within this country. Easy to see in Kathalanga if you go to the northeast. Yeah? Everybody talks of monkeys and langurs or in any of the Hanuman, which is another point, mythology and this thing. One of my next books will, will try to tell you what is a poor Hanuman. I mean, if, if Hanuman existed, it definitely is not a langur, by the way. It doesn't look like a langur. Anatomically all wrong. All, all over North India you say it's, you know, Hanuman is, uh, langur is called a Hanuman langur. It's worshipped even. But no, Hanuman doesn't have a black face. All langurs have a black face. The problem is that North Indian, when he went into South India, encountered a, a monkey with a long tail. Hanuman supposedly was in Vindhya, across the other side. Yeah? A humpy, in today's humpy. If you go there, it's Anjaneya Vetta, where Hanuman was mythologically is supposed to be born. If you go there, it's a modern macaque. But the North Indian was not used to seeing a monkey with a long tail which is not a lagoon. And therefore, if Ram was a North Indian, yeah, mythologically, he thought Hanuman was a South Indian. Which with a long tail had to be a lagoon. But no, totally different face. Not that of a lagoon. But anyway, so it's, it's a wonderful country with a large number of animals that we need to get to know. Alright? And just one or two more. Where the hell is this one? Now it's gone into some other room. Uh, I'm afraid it's searching. Is there anybody in this one? Where do you find these? Uh, sorry, Pulal Gibbon in, in Northeast India. Uh, this seems to have gone into some street mode. So, Pulal Gibbon in Northeast India, uh, one of them in Meghalaya and Assam, and one in Arunachal on the Burma border. Uh, so, I just want to tell you that there are many animals that people don't look at, and in Madhya Pradesh itself, uh, there are animals like the pangolin. Which you can see. Point the towards the laptop and it works. Like I see. Uh, that may well be. Thank you very much. So, you are concentrating on the tiger and the Barasinga, which you should concentrate on being the state animal. I'm glad that Madhya Pradesh has an interesting state animal, which is the Barasinga. Yeah, the Swamiya. But also concentrate on things like the pangolin, which has recently been voted as the most endangered animal by trade. And you know where it's endangered from? From this state. The largest seizures are emanating from this area, Madhya Pradesh, Maharashtra, whatever, Central India. Sorry, that way. Okay. But now I'll stop listening to you too. Yeah. I mean, I borrowed a slide from an enforcement agency here, from your state, right? 
So these things are being killed as we talk about it. So the other point I'm making is, mine is a field guide, but it's not just a good looking book with a lot of pictures, but it should also tell you what to do to conserve them, otherwise you'll lose them. You know? Recently I was following a Twitter feed thing, nowadays you follow Twitter feed, you know the world, about somebody going hammer and tongs, I'm not naming the person, uh, going hammer and tongs against David Attenborough, who's one of the world's best known uh, natural history storytellers, saying that all you have done is tell stories while things are dying. And you should have done something instead of telling stories. And the poor old man in 92 is trying to defend himself by saying, but I made good movies. And then the whole generation of people at least followed him, right? So there are two things. Today morning, Bittu told you, there is no point, and he told me also, he said there is no point in counting the anal hairs of a samba. He said, go out and save it. I'm afraid, uh, perhaps there is no point in saying, counting the anal hairs of a samba, but you should know something about what you are saving. And today most of our people do not, I'm sorry to say, that the lay person, the, ch the children are better, the politician, the foresters still do not know what they are targeting. We were discussing, it's not really management, you know, we are just preserving everything. It's an encyclopedia of ignorance with which you are preserving. I'm not going into that, still, still more slides, and don't make me start on elephants because I've gone for long. But I'll leave some time for his questions and we can come back, and if any of you want to see more slides, you can see that as well. But these are some of the things that my book offers. Thank you, Vivek. You have left me a spellbound. I have forgotten all my questions. Uh, as he actually mentioned about the tiger as a global uh, symbol of global biodiversity. So I, I was in Australia. You must maybe some of you may be knowing. Uh, Tasmania doesn't have any carnivore. Right? There's one Tasmanian devil. It's like a big rat. So they have Tasmanian tiger. They have they have Tasmanian snake. They have Tasman. Uh, sorry. Uh, tiger snake, Tasmanian tiger, tiger bird. So no tiger. So tiger is just a symbol. So, 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 tiger is a uh, symbol of uh, bio, the global biodiversity. Actually, you have partially uh, answered our query about uh, why mammals only. So I, uh, you, uh, you have specialized in mammals. Your book is on mammals. I, I've, so, actually, I've actually specialized on birds. I'm an ornithologist by trade. And people think that I. that uh, if we were not as arrogant a species as we are, 
human beings, we would give personhood to elephants and to perhaps some apes and to perhaps some whales and dolphins. But we won't because personhood is something which only we can get. I don't know why. Being a biologist, there's nothing which says. If you say a person, a person is equal to a combination of intellectual ability, memory, consciousness, etc., 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 and you put it. Other than written language, these things have come so close to us. When I was studying biology, I was told it is it is a recognition of the personal self, the mirror test, which separates humanity from everything else. Can you recognize yourself in a mirror? Well, elephants have crossed that long ago. In 1902 or something, they found that elephants recognize themselves in the mirror and other elephants. So they are very, very intelligent. When I when I explain an elephant to anybody, as I said, it's a child or a politician, head of state. I keep saying four words. It's big. It's even a child can tell you. It's intelligent. It's social. It's a nomad. Okay. If you know these four words, you will know. Now, as, as, as a national highway authority person, you should know. That's a nomad. Never settle an elephant. That thing has to move. So. If you settle an elephant like you settle ancient tribes, anthropologists will tell you it's terrible to do that, to settle a tribe that you know, is nomadic in, in nature. Similarly, certain animals can be settled. Certain animals can't be settled. An elephant has to be. By the way, as, as you now work for roads, as you ask me about elephants, the first roads into the hills were actually cut by uh, engineers, British engineers, on elephant footprints because it was the most stable gradient. You didn't need to measure gradient. The elephant will not put its foot anywhere unless it's stable. And if you look at millennia of tracks, it is easy for uh, the highways in those days. It's not called the highway authority, I'm sure, but the road transport people in the British area to cut uh, roads. And today, the issue we face is that most of these things have been done on elephant tracks. And therefore, now elephants have had to move their path and till where. So we need to figure out ways of, of managing that. Uh, taking a clue from what Vivek shared about the animals, along, in, uh, animals, the wild animals and national highways interface, just I wanted to share that a lot of animals you know are killed in the accidents along national highways. So what we are planning to do and also we, we discuss that, uh, to, to have uh, wildlife corridors, state of art wildlife corridors and World Bank is also uh, working with us closely for that. So, so that uh, we, they have natural passage. So we are discussing that 15, around 15 percent of national highways are passing through roads and uh, uh, roads and uh, the national uh, uh, sorry forests and uh, national park. Just uh, Vivek, I'd like to have your reports on one issue. You have very nicely mentioned the status of every uh, IUCN status of every uh, animal. So uh, probably around 89 species are threatened species. Threatened is one except threatened species. I have another one more concern. So like in case of vultures, so the population of vultures has gone down uh, drastically below 1% and we say it's a population crash. Based on our own experience as a forester, when I used to travel in the forest, we used to see a lot of Chawsingra, ch Jankara and now after say, 25 or 30 years, so I can say that the population, the, probably the population crash has taken place for many other species also. But all of a sudden, we, we arise and awake that this population, this is, uh, and, uh, they, 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 but, uh, we can get uh, threatened for some species like uh, vulture. And uh, sometimes I suggest, I suggested WIA also, can you not have the, the, the population estimate of all the major species, important species, like Chosinka, Chinkara, uh, very important species. So what, what, what is your response to this 89 species out of say 423 species which are threatened? Uh, yeah. uh, especially with respect to the practitioners and the management perspective. Yeah, so uh, you, you started it out by saying that our conservation has been based on tiger as a metaphor for saving larger forests, which is brilliant. That is how the founding fathers of wildlife in India have planned it. Unfortunately, we have stopped at the tiger. You know, or we have stopped for a few animals and we are not really looking at So you mentioned a few things, Chosinga, the four-horned antelope. The only creature in the world which has four horns, by the way. Yeah? It is the only thing which has ever sprouted four parallel horns. Yeah? And this is going down, is what people feel. People like me and you who walk the forest, we know that it's going down. But there is no sound. Nobody knows. Yeah? Uh, so definitely there needs to be regular monitoring of some of these things. We should teach our forest guards who otherwise see to record everything and this should be
be analyzed. Uh, instead of just doing five-way counts, any forest guard who walks will tell you what's in this forest. If, if the person still walks, yeah, that's another issue. We have stopped walking. I keep telling my, my the younger people walk. Yeah, the most important thing for a forester to do or a wildlife conservation to do is walk. However many vehicles you have today, they enter the service or they enter the wildlife institute and first they get a jeep. The worst thing, the wildlife trust of India that I, I uh, run, I don't give anybody a four wheel vehicle unless they've uh, you know, finished 60 years of age or whatever. Bikes are enough. Take your bike, go to the jungle and walk. Don't tell me you need a, a four wheel vehicle. Unless you walk, you won't know the lay of the land and you won't know many of these things. So your chossingers and other things are, you know, are undergrowth uh, skulkers, you won't see unless you walk and you just you take them off. Anyway. Uh, and one observation from your book, as I mentioned from uh, interpretation, uh, information to interpretation. There are so many. Actually, some there are some very interesting interpretations which I actually didn't know. Like termite mounts. I knew that termite mounts are used by the snakes when they are. Like you have mentioned, uh, even the mongoose they use, and of course the pangolins also use. So like this information. So uh, regarding the authenticity of this information or uh, uh, knowing more about this. Uh, in detail, some cross uh, the, the references. What do you suggest for further uh, references? No, no, I mean, <laughs> there's no great, I, I'm sure I've given references wherever I've said something. There's no great references needed for the fact that termite mounds are, are occupied by a vast variety of animals. It's, it's like coral reefs, you know. Termite mounds are in the forest, are used by a huge number of animals birds, insects, other things use it. Uh, it's an ecosystem in itself. It's a species that are right, but also an ecosystem. Just like a So uh, the, the thing is that you must have the ability to be to see, and lots of young people are seeing and observing, and then you need to record it and put it into this thing. So you are seeing my book in one color. I have my book in three colors of my computer, right? It's it's some some things that I have seen myself are in a different color, where I can vouch for it personally. Some things where somebody in recent years has done good research, and I know the person has done good research, is in a different color. Something which I am quoting somebody who has seen something in 1907, which I am telling you is still one third of the book, right? Because Prater wrote a brilliant book and everybody quoted Prater. But Prater himself didn't do anything new. He was quoting Roberts. Roberts didn't do anything new. He was quoting somebody else. So when you look back as to where that actual statement comes from, a lot of things are from the 19th century actually, coming all the way down. So I have my book in three colors and hopefully it's third edition. So you asked me how, I, how I, I came to do this. I went to write a book on, on the national parks of India, not on mammals, which is, by the way, will come out next year. So again, a good information from all, all of you if you wish to. And I went to David David at that stage in Penguin, and he said we will do one on tigers. For, for me. So the compromise was mammals. I said I will not do one on tigers. And he said you have to do something on animals. Don't do one on general national parks. But at that stage, the only mammals book written for India was 1950s was by a white Englishman, Fraser. No Indian had attempted this. When David asked me to do this, I suggested two of my senior big names of in the Indian conservation uh, who were much older than me. And I said, why did you ask them? They have spent 30 years, 40 years. At that stage, they have spent 25 years of my life. Right? Both of them didn't deliver. So I was left to deliver a book. With, and I told David that give me three, four editions to get this perfect. Because nobody since Prater in 1950s had try to do all the animals again. Right? When you said 400 plus, it is, they are all the animals known. All the animals known are in that book. So I took a leap of faith myself. And the last session was on passion and you had a, a lady you know, reading a romance about Bhagavati, right? This was my romance. It, it, it was, I, I, I consumed myself for several years to bring out this book, knowing fully well that it will take several years to get uh, it perfect. But I am absolutely encouraged by the fact that so many young people are now going and walking, using my book like, as I told you when I looked for the Slender Loris, there was a young girl who finished her PhD on the Malabar Slender Loris, which is a difficult one to find, a subspecies. She used my book, she not only uh, used it extensively, but she suggested four corrections in my book. This is the best use of the book. When I was learning birds, I told you about Salima Lisa, which some of you may know, the, uh, you know, uh, the ornithologist who really started the science of bird watching in India. And I used to go to him at my old you know, uh, 
dog-eared book and show him something with great fear that the old man will take umbrage for the fact that I have dog-eared his book. He'll look at it and say, ah, you have used my book. It's so good to see a book is soiled and used. You know? So if somebody uses my book and finds mistakes and corrects it, that is the biggest moment. Yeah, very good. Taking it, you are taking a clue from what you said. Most of us, the foresters, the wildlife workers, the um, experts, they believe that the approach towards wildlife management should be ecosystem management. Ecosystem management. Still, our, our main approach is mostly the uh, species based. Species based are at least killed. It's not ecosystem. Yet. There was a move, recently there was a move also, so to have separate wildlife services. So I, I said this is the illegitimate separation of two children of same parents. How can you think of wildlife without forests? So how, how do you respond to this uh, issue of ecosystem versus uh, species? No, it's, most certainly it has to be conserved as an ecosystem. You cannot conserve individual species. <coughs> individual species cannot live. So you have to protect the habitat. You need to know that. And in any case, most of what we do is really for ourselves. We are not really managing any of these fall at Bangalore. Or the detail. Yeah, we are managing it for humanity to survive in, in, in a philosophical sense. And I, I mean, I, it's too short a time to tell you why we do that, but we do. So it's ecosystem management. However, our soul is based on these few animals that captivate us. And we, we unfortunately will not be driven by needing to preserve bogs and marshes. Yeah, it would be lovely if everybody woke up in the morning and said, let us save a marsh. No, it doesn't happen then. But if you tell people that there is something in there which is beautiful, there is something in there which captivates you, as I said, with forward-facing eyes, yeah, then the person wakes up in the morning and says, I need to save that. Yeah. The whole state, the whole uh, Central India seems to be, uh, to be uh, a dog over saving one tigress, who has been named also by people, right? Uh, right you are wrong. But what, what I'm saying is, this is the power of that individual. Level. And we must use that power of the individual animals and the individual species to save people. Nicely explained. Right. So, uh, I'll throw the forum to the audience. And then last, my last most difficult question will be at oh, the end. That's so, so, now, so someone... I would like to ask Vivek on the end. What in that elephant conflict which happened last year in Delhi. So, from an ornithologist, to a beautiful writer on animals and working to save the corridors of the elephants all over. Now, you know, you come from Madhya Pradesh, there are no elephants. There are some elephants coming into Madhya Pradesh now. And our foresters are in a fix. What to do? Do you have any solution? Yeah, yeah, there, there are plenty of solutions. Uh, elephants are going into six new states. And uh, Madhya Pradesh is one of them. Okay? Uh, but also Chhattisgarh. And I have had the, the good fortune of going and having breakfast with the Chief Minister when they first came in. And he said, I won the election, Menon Sir, but we have uh, Ganeshji I had to bless me. And I told him, Sir, it's not Ganeshji coming to bless you. The elephant's coming because the neighboring state has finished its habitat. Right? And tomorrow when they start killing people, you'll say it's a shaitan. So the issue is the elephant or the tiger is neither Ganeshji nor shaitan. I wish we can follow the and protect it, that's all right. But the point is you have to understand it as an animal and why it's coming into your region. So why it's coming to Madhya Pradesh, unfortunately, is because of certain other states doing, uh, you know, ruining the habitat and finishing off their uh, migratory routes for which they're coming into, into the state. Why it's coming into states like Maharashtra at its bottom edge is because of bad water management. Maharashtra has brilliant water everywhere you see. It was attracted to one way you can stop elephant populations is reduce the water. So if you know biology, you don't need to go and catch these elephants and torture them and put them in captivity and all. Reduce water. Elephants will move away. Yeah, I'm just giving you one simplistic thing. Nothing is simple in life. But uh, you, you have to understand why elephants are moving. I told you, big, intelligent, social, nomads. Right? So they are intelligent, so they move to a better habitat. But they are nomads and they need to keep moving. So if if you are more intelligent than them, as is claimed by certain human beings I know, then we must find out a way of making them move according to the way we want them to. Yeah, which is by understanding their need and education. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I forgot to ask a question to uh, in the morning because time ran out. I just mentioned in my session that if you Google India's website, 
you'll find tigers, Taj Mahal, and the three peas come in front. So in fact, tourism is not tiger centric in the country. It's not by that tourism. It's the tiger tourism which happens. So I think this kind of depiction of variety or diversity of uh, uh, animals and people also plants will be a good idea of the people that must appreciate my things. Mr. Jadis, let me suggest you you can also work further on. I had two very interesting experiences of doing night walks in Kenya Tigerism and Wadi Tigerism. It's amazing. Like right? you said, what you see at night, you know, elephant, you could see the whole family of elephants you know, standing together, which you don't find in the daytime. I think it would be very interesting to also highlight nocturnal animals in the country, where people enjoy that. But there was very, you know, you don't see it in the daytime. And I think that information was very much required. I, I, I can't agree more. I think we have done a disservice by keeping people into tiger safaris. Um, we bundle them into jeeps and ask them to go to certain spots at certain times and, and at times uh, the guard in the back say, Nay sir, 6 o'clock, I mean, we are going to time again. Once in Corbett, once they have that way. And I said, why? And he said, it's Chitalka meeting time. So I said, really? 6 o'clock, they will meet. They will meet at 5.30, they will meet at 6 o'clock. Right? You know that they will. So we have, we have put absurd rules to, to uh, keep tourists off because it's easier for us to manage. But we must really get people exploring. That's, that's Sir, I'd like to add to uh, what you said and others said, like uh, Kana. Kana has got the Parasinga, which is unique to the whole world. So we, we instead of uh, uh, popularizing Kana or showcasing Kana, still uh, uh, showcase Tiger. And tourism, you know, I tell you, I've been in tourism, ecotourism for quite a while. It is a unique experience. It is a unique experience you give uh, to the people and uh, showing Kana, this uh, Barasinga is a, a unique experience. So there is an alarm from the organizer. So we we'll, uh, we'll come to an end and... Uh, yeah, so it's uh, Vivek. What is your experience of uh, the role of tribals in wildlife conservation? And you know, as an administrator, as a public administrator, someone who has dealt with tribals very closely at the macro level, the sense I get is that tribals are very important for conserving wildlife. And some of the problems that have occurred have been because they have been artificially pushed out of the forests and not allowed to get proper settlement within the forest in a legitimate way as a result of which they have an uncertain relationship with the forests, with the wildlife and as a result of which they are exploited commercially by poachers and such like to do all kinds of wrong things vis-a-vis -vis the forests and particularly wildlife. So what is your experience about that? Uh, uh, do you think that is right? What I'm saying or do you think that tribals are a threat to wildlife? Yeah. Uh, no, they're not. Uh, they cannot categorize them as a threat. Why I say that, I am giving you a counterpoint which, the, which uh, I, I get the impression that the forest department has a very adverse approach and view of the tribals. Uh, and given a choice between wildlife and tribals, the forest department may choose wildlife. So, what's your take on that? It's a rather controversial question, but no, I like it's it. actually not. Uh, I mean, we make these things controversial, but you said it yourself, a forest dwelling tribe, let's, let's differentiate a tribe uh, who's a tribe by, by, uh, by birth, but who is in parliament today, from a real forest dwelling tribe. A forest dwelling tribe definitely has the, uh, the heart and the knowledge of that ecosystem. However, I will not romanticize it to the extent of saying because a person is a, is a tribal, they will look after the forest. Not necessarily. Because those individuals also are, 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 uh, have the same pressures of greed that non tribals have. Yeah? So, knowledge, most certainly, and we must use them. Uh, and I think that the old way of throwing them out was completely wrong and it should not have been done. Um, and uh, I, I think the time has come, and we have done through the For uh, Tribal Act uh, as well, uh, ways of returning legitimately forest dwelling tribes back. But I, I fear greatly that this will then be used as a cow for others uh, you know, to take away land. And we must understand land issues in this country, which I'm sure you know better than most people. And as long as that's not, you know, the forests are not pillaged in the name of tribals or in the name of industry, that's fine.
Um, Raghu Chandra Sen has raised a very, very pertinent issue of forest tribal interface. I'll, I'll uh, further go that now tribals are an integral part of the forest ecosystem. If you do, and now they are, they are a component of the forest ecosystem. If you do not address, so you cannot have the overall conservation strategy for uh, our for, for, for forest. So, uh, sir, I, I was just one point I wanted to share. I was attending some other sessions also in other rooms. I find there is one, one uh, common issue, common denominator in all the sessions I was finding. The sustainability. The sustainability of the uh, environment, sustainability of culture, sustainability, economic sustainability. So, this sustainability is the undercurrent probably in all our, our uh, spheres. So, that's what I observed. So lastly, the last, my last question to uh, our uh, honored guest, uh, my friend, what was the taste of that coffee which was seaweed defecated seed? You have... <laughs> When he said the last question is going to be difficult, I asked him, are you a cricketer? Did you board googlies in your life? <laughs> but anyway. So, you know, it, 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 it's a very interesting thing. He writes, the only captive seaweed I saw was in Bali, Indonesia. It was kept not for farming seaweed, but for ingesting coffee seeds and the defecating them. That coffee is the costliest in the world. And the... Uh, uh, the uh, the regulant seeds were ground into a brew that was one of the most expensive coffees in the world. Civet coffee. I had a cup. What was the taste like? It tasted like coffee. Very good coffee. I have some at my home if any of you wish to come and visit me. Uh, I can also give you other coffees. Uh, but, but this is, is basically a test of what does a good coffee be. Yeah, I I'm a small farmer as well in Kerala. I also grow some coffee. But apart from coffee, I grow rice. But I, I try not to protect it from wild animals because I'm not dependent. I'm a dependent farmer. I'm a gentleman farmer, right? But my my, my farmhand tells me, but sir, your grain, all the birds are coming to your grain. I, I, I use organic things. And I say, very birds have better brains than you because they, they are not going to the other one. They're coming to my grain because it is organic. So like that. Good coffee, as palm cigarette, there's a palm cigarette, will ingest only good coffee beans, right? So it's got better brains than us. And then what it takes out, the bean is still intact. But you know it's the best coffee. We have to it as So that's it. It's very good. Thing. Excellent. Thank you, Vivek. Uh, because this discussion was as useful as his book is. So a big hand to Vivek. And thank you very much. Thank you for watching the session from BLF 2019. Kindly subscribe to our channel for more such videos.